one more paleo flood presentation. And specifically on this one, we're going to dive into the hydraulic and hydrologic analysis that goes into the paleo flood analysis. Our learning objectives here are to discuss the pre and post field investigation hydraulic analysis to support paleo floods and describe how paleo flood results are incorporated into flow frequency analysis. So we want to provide useful information about what discharge ranges might be associated with the different elevations and geomorphic features we found in the field, whether they're positive evidence of floods or PSIs or evidence of no floods and landscape stability, again, that we call non-exceedance bounds or NEBs. So first we'll talk about data acquisition, including study reach identification, which we discussed in the previous lecture. And once you know where your study reach is, we need to acquire gauge data, like from a USGS gauge, field measurements, including indirect measurements, such as slope areas that are often done for large historical floods, um, historical flood reports. What is our problem maximum flood? What existing hydraulic analysis do we have? And what's the best terrain data that we can find for this reach? So first, we want to find the obvious and readily available USGS gauge data to understand flow magnitudes that we have observed for our study reach. We can find this on the USGS NWIS website. And identifying the largest flood that we know about or flood of record is a really important part of the pre-field investigation. Historical flood reports are essential to understand large historical floods in your reach. They are sometimes, and these are sometimes also the flood of record. These can offer valuable information, including post-flood photographs, surveys of high water marks, and computations for estimating the peak flow, often using indirect methods. So many of these are available online, or if they're not available online, I've had really good luck requesting them from the local USGS offices. We want to know the largest flood measurements and the high water mark profiles and where those cross sections were taken. That can be really, really beneficial for calibrating our hydraulic model to the biggest floods we've seen. Because when we're doing our paleo flood investigation, we want to look at floods bigger than that. So calibrating to the biggest we've seen is the best we can typically do. So the probable maximum flood or the PMF, just the definition is the it it may be the it's sorry, the definition for a PMF may be expected from the most severe combination of critical meteorological and hydrologic conditions that are reasonably possible in a particular drainage area. So this is important in pre-field investigation hydraulic analysis for paleo floods because it sets that theoretical upper limit for the largest flood we would ever expect to see in the study reach. So it's a good practice to find any previously completed hydraulic analysis this can be from FEMA flood insurance study modeling, um, core modeling, such as mapping modeling and consequence or MMC modeling. And if you don't know, that's hydraulic modeling that's typically used for estimating consequences for both breach and non-breach scenarios downstream of our dams and, and along our levees. Um, core water management system modeling could be used. And that often includes hydraulic modeling downstream of dams more for operational purposes. Or maybe the core district did a study for a different reason, but getting existing modeling is always a good place to start. It's always important to reach out to the district and any other organization associated with that reach to get as much local knowledge and resources as possible, including but not limited to terrain data, hydrographic surveys, any additional historic data. High resolution terrain has proven extremely beneficial in the paleo flood analysis in all phases of, our, of a paleo flood, whether it's tier one, two, or three. Um, it's critical to, for uh, identifying geologic surfaces and to, as an input to our hydrodynamic modeling. Um, USGS elevation data is a great source to start with, but states, counties, and cities often have GIS websites and offices. Even districts and the project owners may have collected their own GIS information and they might have higher resolution terrain data. So it's always good to take the time to do that investigation and get the best terrain data that you can. So once you've acquired the best data you have, um, it's time to start modeling. So the level of hydraulic modeling can range from as simple as a slope area calculation at a single cross section to a very detailed 1D or 2D model in a software like HEC RAS. Um, choosing the correct level of modeling is very important given a number of factors. We kind of discussed them in the previous presentation. It includes the level of study. 
Um, remember, a level one viability reconnaissance study, so that's kind of like the initial study, it might use more simple calculations or a 1D model. And as we move up, we want to start using 2D models, typically for level two and three studies. Um, with any model, it's important to calibrate, and we typically include routing flood magnitudes ranging from common observed events up to our flood of record. Um, USGS field measurement data and water sur surface elevation surveys and high water marks should all be used to best calibrate our model. And we can evaluate the predictive capability of our model using graphical and statistical methods. Calibrating to the largest event is the most important since we're typically looking for paleo floods larger than that flood of record. Just to reiterate that point. So model inundations for the flood of record and the probable maximum flood are both very important in the pre-field investigation process. So the area or elevations between these two inundation boundaries, so between the, the flood of record and the PMF, is typically where the paleo flood investigation sites will be targeted. So we wanna look for evidence of paleo floods that were larger and higher and older than the flood of record, and evidence of paleo floods at or below the flood of record likely would have been disturbed by that flood of record event. Um, geologic evidence of the flood of record is often investigated as part of the paleo flood study. Um, on the other end, we don't need to look for PSI or NAB evidence too much higher than our estimated PMF, since that is a theoretical upper limit of floods we would ever expect to see for this reach or watershed. So, for example, if we found a non exceedance bound evidence of no flood much higher than what we think our PMS, PMF is, that's like saying we found evidence that a flood bigger than the PMF has never happened here, which we were already probably pretty confident in before we went out into the field, and that won't add much value to our study. So here we see some flow profiles that were developed for flows ranging from near the flood of record, probably this bottom red line here, up to the PMF. And these are also important. They can be used to help understand the inundation of different geomorphic surfaces along the study reach. All of this hydraulic data can be used to inform and assist in both the planning and the execution of the field investigation. All right, so we did everything pre-field, we went in the field, so now we're talking about the post-field investigation process. So once the field team identified terraces and the other geologic and geomorphic locations that may provide evidence of paleo floods, this information can be used to refine our hydraulic model. Um, some examples of refinement may include recalibrating the model based on geologic evidence of the flood of record. So maybe we calibrated to some upstream or downstream gauge. Now within our reach, we found geologic evidence of the flood of record. So now we have a new really good calibration point to help refine our model. Um, we might wanna make, we might wanna refine our model by making our cell size smaller at the terraces that we're looking at to inform the, the uh, paleo flood analysis. We, that way we can better understand inundation velocities and shear stresses at the locations that are most interesting to us for our paleo flood analysis. We need to perform sensitivity analysis on model parameters to quantify the variability and flow magnitudes based on those parameters. So typical sensitivity runs include channel and overbank roughness values, we'll vary those, and downstream boundary conditions. So if we look on the plot on the right here, these are showing um, profiles of different sensitivity runs for a given flow rate by varying the channel and overbank roughness. So you can see how that affects the profiles here as well as the downstream boundary condition. So it looks like in this one, they change the normal depth um, to account for that uncertainty as well. The paleo flood parameter set should best represent the condition of the study reach prior to any significant cultural modifications, including prior to construction of any dams. Um, the parameter set should reflect the best estimate of reach conditions that existed during the formation of the paleo flood terraces and the associated paleo flood landforms. So this could result in the need for having two different parameter sets. You might have one that's your calibration to your historical floods but you might vary your model to try to best represent what it was like in the paleo flood era. Paleo flood analysis can be structured to ensure that geometric non-stationarity is negligible or minimized by selecting reaches with the geometric stability of river channel and the valley over long periods of time. So qualities like resistant bedrock is a good reason to, make, to have a good candidate paleo flood site. 
So this means we can use modern or historic channel and overbank train geometry information to inform paleo flood routings. So in this example here, um, portions of the White River Paleo Flood study reach had developed floodplains at the time of a large historic event used to calibrate the model. So just to reiterate, the floodplains were developed during the flood of record. So these areas would have been undeveloped during the time of a paleo flood. So the floodplain roughness should be adjusted from the historical calibrations. I mean, in this example, the roughness values calculated for an undeveloped floodplain in the downstream tributary in a wilderness parklands were used to inform that adjustment. So just to reiterate, in the reach we were looking at for paleo floods, there was development in the floodplains. So when they calibrated to that historic event, that wouldn't represent what it would have been like a multiple thousand year old paleo flood. So they went to a nearby site that had similar qualities but hadn't been developed and they had a calibrated model there. So they used those roughness values at our site to give a best estimate of what the paleo flood conditions would have been. And remember, when we select sites, we can make a reasonable assumption of channel and valley geometry stability so modern historic terrain can be used to model paleo floods. So once hydraulic modeling is complete and reviewed, as well as geologic mapping and interpretation, the team will elicit a range of discharges that created the different paleo stage indicators or that did not disturb or erode the non-exceedance bounds. Note that the elicitation is multidisciplinary and that all team members have their own assumptions and methodologies for assigning flood magnitudes to the different features that we found in the field. The ultimate goal is to achieve a reasonable estimate of the uncertainty for the paleo flood magnitude discharges. Hydraulic modeling results such as profiles and inundation depths, velocities and shear stresses are useful tools in eliciting these flow magnitudes. Velocities required to transport and deposit materials is a key consideration during elicitation. And we often use resources like this Holstrom curve that, that uh, presents sediment transport threshold. So we can see for different materials, it kind of says the range of velocities that it would take to, to transport, drop, and erode different materials. We often refer to these kind of things when we're doing these uh, paleo flood discharge elicitations. Presented here is an example of elicited flow magnitudes for a paleo flood study. Um, note that in this example, there's no age uncertainty documented since this presentation is concentrating on the hydrology and the hydraulics. But please know that in practice, uncertainty in age estimates is also quantified. So here it looks like we have a non-exceedance bound, a PSI, and a historic flood. So we have a low estimate, a best estimate, and a high estimate of discharge for those different features. And it looks like we're showing just our best estimate age, but in reality, we'll also have a low and best for the age as well. So we showed this figure in the previous lecture, but just to reiterate, this is the chronology plot that represents how the paleo flood results are input into flow frequency analysis. Again, on the right, we have our 100 year systematic data and we have a historic flood. We have our paleo stage indicator estimated to have occurred about 900 years ago with an estimated flow interval of around 100 to 190,000 CFS. This also informs the perception threshold from the time of the paleo flood to the historic period. Then we have this large non-exceedance bound here at a discharge of approximately 230,000 CFS over a period of approximately 5,000 years to inform a perception threshold from around 5,000 years ago to the estimated date of our paleo stage indicator or PSI. Again, adding this paleo flood information increases the length of our flow record, which gives us greater confidence and reduces uncertainty in our flow frequency relationship most of the time. Here's some key references with links again. Be good to add these to your favorites if you're working through a paleo flood analysis. So in summary, we talked about pre-field investigation hydraulic analysis. Talked a lot about data acquisition and hydraulic modeling, including the importance of doing your best to model the flood of record and the PMF inundation. We talked about post field investigation hydraulic analysis, including model refinement and sensitivity analysis to quantify uncertainty. And we talk about the use of profiles, velocity and shear stresses in the discharge elicitation and how all those results get rolled in and applied to our flow frequency analysis.